scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke 10, 25 through 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when arrived in the, at that place, came and looked and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and he saw him and had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring the oil and the wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will again, I will obey you. So which of these three do you think the neighbor to him fell among the thieves? And he said, you, you who showed mercy. And then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. When we have the title of our message, and, and I told Sharon early in the week, it's probably Monday, that, that I think I want to entitle it, Love Everybody. That was before the events that took place later on in the week. And, and I just felt like that, that God was working then because this is just a perfect title for a message that I think that, that we need today. We have a lawyer in this story. Not necessarily one as we know. This is a lawyer that, that knew the religious laws of the time. But he was well studied. And he knew those laws very well. He might have even thought he knew those laws better than Jesus. But he stands up. By standing up, he's drawing attention to himself. It kind of lets us know a little bit more about him. And then he says, what must I do? What must I do to inherit or, or to have eternal life? Now he's thinking about himself. He tells us a little more about what kind of person he might have been. But Jesus answers him with a question. You know the law. What does the law say that you do? The lawyer must have felt good because he knew the answer to this question. He quoted Deuteronomy 6.5, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. He went on to quote Leviticus 19.18, Do not take revenge or bear grudge against your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says that's absolutely right. That is correct. Do this and you will live. Don't know if that's the answer the lawyer wanted. He's still kind of thinking that there's something that he must do, he himself must do, to inherit eternal life. So in order to justify himself, he says, well, who's my neighbor? I think that he is wanting Jesus to give him limits as who he is supposed to love. But we know that God has no limits. God's love is not defined by race, creed, or gender. Our neighbors are those in need, those made in the image of God. God put people in our life to help us or to be helped. I read a story about two horses that were in a lot and from the road, they looked like all the horses. One was a little smaller than the other. But if you examine a little closer, you would see that one of those horses was blind. And the other horse, the smaller one, was wearing a small brass bell. Now, the horse that was blind became 
aware of that veil and where it was at all times. And the little horse that, that wore that veil never strayed too far away. And the farmer just couldn't bear to have that horse that was blind put down. So, so he made a special place, a special barn for him. And each evening when they would head to the barn, that little horse with the veil never strayed too far away. Always just a few steps ahead, never too far away, guiding, leading the blind horse. God is like the owner of those horses. He looks down at our brokenness and he sees us. He doesn't cast us away. He provides people in our life, friends, family, neighbors, like the little horse with that veil. Sometimes we are that horse with the veil. We are guiding, leading with assurance someone in need. And then there are times we are that blind horse, that blind horse that needs guidance, that needs to be led. Either way, God provides for us. God provides a way for us, either someone to love or for us to love them or for them to love us. You know, I read somewhere that we should live every day as if it were our last. And one day we'll be right. If we love everybody, then we're loving our neighbor. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now we know this was a very dangerous road and it was full of thieves and robbers and there are all kinds of places for an ambush. I actually read that they call this road the Bloody Way. This man is jumped and he's beaten nearly half to death and left to die. The priest sees the beaten man, crosses to the other side and passes by. The Levite does the same. He crosses to the other side. Out of sight, out of mind, maybe. Which reminds me of this old song uh, that came out several years ago. It talks about ignoring our problems. Thinking, ignoring our problems, they would go away. This guy's in his pickup truck and the check engine light comes on. Oh, there's really nothing wrong. So he takes a piece of black tape and he puts it over that check engine light. It doesn't take long for that really nothing wrong to go up and smoke. When we ignore the problems of our neighbor, the ones we love, it does not go away. And sometimes we risk losing that very thing that we love the most. So the priest and the Levite, they think that that's not their problem. They're not really concerned about that beaten man. I heard another story about this mouse, and he's peering through the cracks in the walls. And he sees the farmer's wife opening something, and that mouse is thinking, I've got a good meal tonight. But he looks a little closer, and he realizes that it's a mouse trap. <laughs> now, he's scared. So he runs out into the barnyard and runs right into the chicken and says, hey, they got a mouse trap in there. Can you help me out? Chicken says, that's not my problem. I'm a chicken. That's a mouse trap. That's your problem. Take care of it. So he runs over to the pig. Almost the same attitude. He says, Pig says, I'll pray for you, but I'm not worried about a little old mouse trap. So he goes to the cow. The cow is really not worried, as big as that cow is. I'm not worried about a little old mouse trap. Well, that night, that night, there's an echo in the house of a sprung mouse trap. The farmer's wife goes to check on that trap. In the dark, she doesn't realize that it's a venomous snake that has been caught by the tail of that trap, and that snake bites her. So the doctor, well, the, the farmer has to take her to the doctor, and she spent some time in the hospital. She comes home, and what's better to cure her if you're not feeling better than, than some chicken soup? Well, you know that the, the farmer had to go out to the barnyard for the main ingredient. Well, she still didn't improve very much. She got worse, and the more people came, the farmer had to feed them, so, you know, the pig was next in line. She never did recover from, from, from that snake bite, and so many people 
turned out for the funeral, but he had to feed them too. Cows next in line. The point I'm trying to make is when the least of us are threatened, we are all at risk. When one of us is in trouble, we're all in trouble. When one of us is hurting, when one of us is in need, we're all in need. We have to love everybody. The Samaritan is the only one who stops. And you know, they call this story the Good Samaritan. And that's kind of like an oxymoron. If you know anything about the Samaritans of that day, that's kind of like saying jumbo shrimp or act naturally. Or that's pretty ugly. Or alone together. Original copy. Those are oxymorons. And that's kind of what the Good Samaritan would be. But he's the only one that stops. And he just doesn't stop. He dresses his wounds. He lets him ride until they found a place to stop. And he tells the innkeeper to take care of him. He would repay his expenses. Now, how many of us would have remembered the, the Samaritan if he had only had good intentions? It does not matter how good our intentions are. It's how good our actions are. Notice when Jesus asks, which of the three is the neighbor? The lawyer still stuck in his ways just said the one that showed mercy he wouldn't give or acknowledge the Samaritan. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Some weeks ago, I talked about how God begins working and showing us things that will be important long before we even realize it. Sometimes we never realize. Uh, in college, I had to do a paper on a poem of my choice. Uh, we had to just dissect the poem and let, let the, write the paper about what we thought it meant or what, where the writer was at the time, what was going on in his life. And I chose a poem, House by the Side of the Road by Sam Walter Foss. And it was just a beautiful poem, and, and I loved it. I wasn't familiar with it. My dad... A lot, some people, some people know my dad, but uh, when, when he was about 55, uh, he had been having some vascular problems in his leg, and he had to have his right leg amputated at the knee. Now, he still mowed his yard and drove his own truck around, so it didn't slow him down a lot, but within a couple of years after that, he had to have his other leg amputated, and I honestly thought that that might be it. He might give up, but he didn't. He, he was able to get one of those motorized little scooter chairs and he was able to get around. He lived right on the main stretch in Cross Plains. That's Highway 25. So he was, there wasn't too many times I'd go to town and didn't see him at the Dollar General store or down at the Piggly Wiggly or True's Barbecue. He was just out. New freedom. He loved it. At the end of the day, he would sit at the edge of his yard Right there on the sidewalk, cars are going by, passing by. I sat with him several times and he would wave at me. They would honk at him. Who is that, Dad? I don't know. They wave at me every day, so I just wave back at them. We lost my dad 12 years ago this December. A lady came up to me during visitation. I did not recognize her. I did not know her. She said, I want to tell you something about your dad. I know you don't know me, and I really didn't know him. But every day on my way home from work, after a stressful day at work, I would look over at your dad's yard, and he would be out there waving and smiling. That brightened my day. He inspired me. I thought about what was going on in his life and what was going on in my life. And he was such an inspiration to me, and I just wanted you to know that. I was so thankful I didn't realize that. God looks down at our brokenness, and he still uses that today. At the funeral, the pastor that spoke was at the pastor at the Methodist church just a few doors down, and he had got to know my dad pretty well. And uh, he chose a poem to read at my dad's 
funeral, house by the side of the road, by Sam Walter Falls. All those years had gone by, and that poem resurfaced. And I talked to him afterwards, and I said, I hadn't heard that poem in a long time. And he said, I thought of your dad when I read that poem. I thought of your dad. On the side of the road, there are hermit souls that live withdrawn in the place of their self-content. There are souls like stars that dwell apart in a fellowless firmament. There are pioneer souls that blaze their paths where highways never ran, but let me live in a house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. Let me live in a house by the side of the road where the race of men go by. The men who are good, the men who are bad, as good and as bad as I. I would not sit in the scorner's seat or hurl the cynic's band. Let me live in a house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. I see from my house by the side of the road, by the side of the highway of life, the men who press on with the ardor of hope, the men who are faint with the strife. But I turn not away from their smiles nor their tears, both part of an infinite plan. Let me live in a house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. I know that there are brook gladdened meadows ahead and mountains of wearisome height, that the road passes on through the long afternoon and stretches away to the night. But still I rejoice when the travelers rejoice and weep with the strangers that moan, nor live in my house by the side of the road like a stranger that lives alone. God was still using my dad. I didn't even realize. And he didn't either. He just thought there was nothing else to do. I'll just sit outside. But God was still using him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Those are Jesus' words that we must live by. The usual human approach may be to love himself, to love the world, and then love God. I'll pray if I have time to pray. I'll read my Bible if the Kentucky game is over in time. I'll follow God's law if it doesn't interfere with my life too much or with the things that I want to do. I'll follow God's law if there's time. In Deuteronomy, or in Galatians 2.19, it says this, For through the law I died to the law, so that I may live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who has loved me and gave himself for me. What Jesus is saying here is that we must die within ourselves so that Christ may live within us. When we allow Christ to live within us, we receive a newness, a spiritual awakening that allows God's law to come alive within us through our words and our actions. But this awareness does not come by our doing, but rather what we allow Christ to do within us. Jesus says that we must love everybody. And you know as well as I do, sometimes that's hard. There are some people in this world that don't seem to want to be loved. They don't seem to have God in their hearts. Those are the people that need us the most. When we allow God in our hearts, forgiveness is easier. Dying within ourselves is easier. Loving everybody is easier. Sometimes we are that veil in the distance that we're straying too far away, guiding others to a place of comfort. Sometimes we seek the sound and comfort that that veil brings and the assurance that that veil will not lead us astray. God looks down at our brokenness and puts people in our life to love us, puts people in our life to be loved. In John 3.30, it says, He must become greater, and I 
must become less. I must become less. That part of us that holds a grudge, that part of us that angers, that part of us that hates, that part of us that discriminates. When we die within ourselves, there is a newness that is born. A new spirit that lives within us. The spirit of God. God is love. God loves everybody. We must love everybody. In Jesus' name, amen.